Well, welcome everyone. So uh, I don't spell well, so hopefully I've started out by spelling one of the hardest words in the English language, arithmetic, right? I always feel like there should be another A in there somewhere. But yeah, and then, you know, I double check and triple check, and sure enough, I think I got it right. So this is, uh, as, as John mentioned, a pretty simple multiplication table. And uh, you know, I think we all know how to read the multiplication table pretty easily, right? So if I did uh, four times six, I connect this row four with column six, and where those two things intersect, I uh, see that I have 24, right? So we were taught how to do that at quite a young age, right? And we don't probably think about it this way, but I remember when I got my first multiplication table, you know, I took my pencil and I traced it, and then pretty soon I needed a new multiplication table because I had a bunch of lines written all over it, right? Uh, and that's an evidence of the fact that when I multiply, let's say, three times nine, I am making a connection from three to nine in some way. And we've just sort of putting it in this row column form when we do that. But I'm making a connection for three, and I connect to nine, and I get 27, right? So this is our sort of multiplication table. Now, we are going to build on that idea, except for we're not going to write our multiplication table in a, a square array. We're going to do it in a circle, right? And uh, a long time ago, you used to have uh, circle tables where you'd have a table inside of a table and a wheel, and you'd spin the wheel, and then the two would match up, and then that would tell you a multiplication table similar to this, right? So I, the inside wheel would be three, and I'd match it to three, and the outside wheel would be seven, I'd match it to seven, and where the two lined up would tell me 21, right? So we don't see a lot of those anymore. I think some of those have been replaced by, well, frankly, the cell phone, right? So, but things like that were commonplace for a long time. Uh, we're going to use some of that idea, except for we're going to spin it a little bit and uh, use arithmetic, but use modular arithmetic. OK, a little review about modular arithmetic. Maybe some of us for the first time learning how to do modular arithmetic. So let's start small. If I have 8 divided by 4, that's equal to 2. And 4 goes into uh, 8 exactly two times. And if I think about 8 divided by 4 equals 2, that's the same thing as saying 2 times 4 equals 8. All right, so 2 times 4 makes 8. Let's do one a little bit harder. 8 divided by 3 equals 2 plus 2 thirds. Or sometimes we might say 2 and 2 thirds. And that's because. If I have 2 and 2 thirds, 2 plus 2 thirds times 3, so 2 and 2 thirds times 3, that simplifies to 6 plus 2, which is 8. OK? So far, so good? All right. We could say that 8 divided by 3 equals 2. 8 divided by 3 equals 2. And we have a remainder equal to 2. That's what I first learned how to do uh, division, right, is I just had this remainder. And if you remember, I take my remainder, my remainder, and I put it on top of the denominator over there, and I get the 2 thirds, right? So I have uh, 8 divided by 3 equals 2 with a remainder of 2. How about this one? 7 divided by, one, uh, 7 divided by 5 equals 1, and the remainder is equal to 2, right? And I could also say that. Uh, 1 times 5 makes 5, plus 2 makes 7. So 1 times 5 makes 5, plus 2 makes 7. Look at this one. 13 divided by 4 is 3, with a remainder of 1. And I take 3 times 4, which makes 12, plus my remainder 1, and I get to 13. All right? If I think about it the same way, but a little bit different language here, look at my example of. 8 divided by 3 equals 2, remainder 2. All right. This is, uh, remember what I did is I multiplied 2 times 3, 2 times 3, and I added the 2, 2 times 3, and added the 2. Well, what I've done is really saying 2 times 3 is 3 copied twice, so 3 plus 3, 
plus 2 equals 8. Then if I sort of solve for 2 by subtracting 3 twice to the left side, I get 8 minus 3 minus 3 equals 2. So effectively, I could think about this as 8 divided by 3 equals 2 remainder 2 because I'm subtracting two copies of 3 from 8, and when I was done, I get 2. So that's another way to think about it, right? Uh, let's look at this ne next example. 7 divided by 5 equals 1, remainder 2. So once again, if I think about 1 times 5 makes 5, plus 2 more makes 7. 1 times 5 makes 5, plus 2 more equals 7. But if I subtract that 5, I subtract away one copy of 5 from 7, I have this remainder of 2. Okay. What I just did there, this is a shortcut symbol for all of that. So this is a red, a 4 mod 3. Some people would say 4 modular 3. Um, I'm not sure which way is correct, but I usually use the word mod. So 4 mod 3. And this symbol, some people would say is equal, some people say is congruent to. Eh, I'll slip up and say equal and congruent interchangeably sometimes, which is eh, kind of fuzzy. Not quite right, but we're among friends, right? So if I slip up and say congruent and equal, you'll forgive me, I'm sure. So 4 mod 3 is congruent to 1. Well, that's because if I take 4 divided by 3, uh, 4 divided by 3 equals 1, but the remainder of 1. Once again, 1 times 3 makes 3, plus this 1 makes, uh, makes the 4. OK, let's try this one. Uh, 5 mod 2 equals 1, congruent to 1. Well, that's the same idea. 5 divided by 2, 5 divided by 2 equals 1 with a remainder of 1. And that remainder is this part over there in the mod. All right, fair enough. OK, here's another example. 8 mod 3 is congruent to 2, because 2 times 3 makes 6. 2 more, 7, 8, so the remainder is 2. Let's look at a couple of special cases that we got to think about what's actually happening here. 16 mod 8 is congruent to 0. Hmm. 16 divided by 8 equals 2 with no remainder, right? So that's why uh, it's congruent to 0. Uh, the next one on the list is uh, 5 mod 5. 5 divided by 5 is 1 with no remainder. So then that's congruent to 0. And then how about 100 mod 10 is congruent to 0? Because 100 divided by 10 equals 10 with no remainder. All right, those ones are pretty easy. What about this one? 2 mod 7. Well, 2 mod 7 is equal to 2. Now, this is kind of the hardest one, but it's not really hard. 2 divided by 7 is equal to 0 with a remainder of 2. What? How could 2 divided by 7 be equal to 0? Well, it's 2 divided by 7 is equal to 0, remainder 2, right? So 2 divided by 7 equals 0. And then I put my remainder over the denominator. And so 0 plus 2 over 7, right? So the remainder is 2. And then if I do 7 times 0 plus 2 over 7, I get 7 times 0 plus 2 over 7, which is equal to 0 plus 2 equals 2. Okay? Now, the truth is no one ever thinks of that one this way. What you do is a shortcut. You say, well, if uh, the number on the outside is smaller than the number on the inside, it's just the number on the outside. Much easier than thinking about that whole process every time. Right? OK, so this one, right? 3 mod 5, so 3 is less than 5, so we get 3. 1 mod 10 is 1, 1 is less than 10 is 1. But I could go through this process each time. OK, so fair enough. That's our quick, quick learning on what modular arithmetic is and how to think about that. So the big thing is, is as I do 2 mod 7 is 2, and I do 16 mod 8 is 0 because I have no remainder. And if I did 4 mod 3, that's 1 because 4 divided by 3 equals 1 with that remainder of 1. OK? OK. So we need all of those tools to do the thing that we're going to do. So take your uh, sheet, and on the front side is a circle with uh, eight dots on it. 
So let's use the one on the top first. And uh, we're going to start with the times 2. So I left you some space over here in the corner to, to write it all out yourself. So the first thing I would like for you to do is uh, label all of your little dots. The fancy name for those is nodes. And so that we all get the same picture, I'm going to start with my 0 over here on the left. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then uh, 8 is the same as 0 in mod 8. So really, this red 8, I've made it red. We don't need that one. Just put 0. So I have that. So far, so good. We got them all numbered. OK. So starting with 0, uh, I have 2 times 0 equals 0. And uh, 2 times 0 equals 0 is the 0 mod 8 is 0. So I'm going to draw a line from 0 to 0. That's not very exciting. There's, this is a dot, right? So we kind of skipped that one because there's nothing really to do there. It's important in math, but not for a picture. OK, finally, something exciting. 2 times 1, so we're doing times 2. We did 2 times 0. Now we're doing 2 times 1. 2 times 1 makes 2. And 2 mod 8 equals 2. So we're going to make our table by drawing a line from 1 to 2. So from 1 to 2, I connect those with my line. So I did 2 times 1. Now I'm going to do 2 times 2. So 2 times 2 is 4. And 4 mod 8 makes 4. So I'm going to draw a line from 2 to 4. Connect those 2 to 4. And after the first two steps, you got something that looks like that. You say, well, mine doesn't look like that, Mr. Hadley. <sighs> That's OK. You're taking artistic license. right? What's next? Times 3. 2 times 3 makes 6. 6 mod 8 is congruent to 6. So I draw a line from 3 to 6. Two times four makes eight. And eight modular eight is zero. So I draw a line from four to zero. From four to zero. Two times five makes 10. And 10 mod eight is congruent to two. So 8 divided by, or 10 divided by 8 is uh, 1 with the remainder 2. So 10 mod 8 is 2. So I draw a line from 5 to 2. So from 5 to 2. And next is 6. So 2 times 6 makes 12. And uh, 12 mod 8 is 4. So I connect 6 and 4. And then I have one more. 2 times 7 makes 14. 14 mod 8 is congruent to 6. So I connect 7 to 6. And then finally, I'd have 2 times 8. But 2 times 8 is 16, which is uh, congruent to 0. So I, 8 and 0 are the same, right? So I don't bother with that one. So I don't bother with the 0, and I don't bother with all of the things that would make it 0, because I would just be keep putting a dot on the page. So hopefully, you have a design that looks like that on your, on your uh, top right-hand corner. Very pretty, huh? Very nice. OK, let's do a, a one a little bit harder. How about uh, mod 8 times 4? So right below that one, you have a circle with 8 dots. So label them 0 through 7 again. And this is times 4. We'll go a little faster through this one once you get them all labeled. Be neat. We want your stuff to look neat, right? So 
So four times one is four. Four mod eight is four, so I connect one to four. Four times two is eight, and eight mod eight is zero, so I connect from two to zero. Four times three makes 12. 12 mod eight is four, so I connect three to four. Four times four is 16. 16 mod eight is zero, so I connect four to zero. Four times five makes 20. 20 mod eight is four, so I connect five to four. Four times six is 24. 24 mod eight is zero, so I connect six to zero. Four times seven makes 28. 28 mod eight is four, so I connect seven to four. And then I don't do four times eight, right? Because four times eight is mod eight is just zero again, so I'd just be drawing a dot on eight to zero. So hopefully you have a picture that looks like that. A little bit more exciting than the other one, right? Okay, flip your page over. Let's do mod 16 times three. So you label them all from zero all the way around to 15, 16 complete nodes. And then I'll put the chart up here for you. I've done them all, three times one, three times two. So you can look over here for a little cheat sheet and uh, fill that out and see what it looks like. And I will peruse the room and critique your work. Look very nice, yes, very nice. So you can imagine like you could use different colors, right? And you could have some sort of pattern where you decide when I multiply by the numbers on the bottom group, I'm gonna do one color, and the ones on the top group, I do a different color. Or when I multiply by an odd number, I do a color, and the even, I do a color. And I can get all kinds of patterns, or maybe you do by threes, right? So I do, I don't know, red, blue, green, red, blue, green, red, blue, green, red, something like that, right? So lots of different choices to make some aesthetically pleasing uh, things. Um, that's the shape that I got when I did mine. Looks like most of us are successful with that. Very nice. I'm also uh, immediately fascinated by the symmetry that's happening, right? So it looks exactly symmetrical, both horizontally, vertically on, on a diagonal. Very, very neat stuff. Okay, one last one. How about um, modular 16 times two on the last one there? So once again, I made this uh, cheat sheet for you. So I'm multiplying two times one, two times two, calculating what that is in modular 16, connecting the appropriate things. So what do you think? Is this what you got? So once again, you know, you could make this uh, stylistically, you know, with some choices by doing maybe the top or the bottom different colors or choosing uh, odds or evens or in sets of threes or whatever you chose to do. All right. So these are lots and lots and lots of fun to play around with. So I have chosen a few that I think are kind of neat. So this is uh, 16, modular 16 times 16. Um, modular 16 times eight. These ones are very easy to do on your own with uh, pencil and uh, paper. Um, drawing the correct angles so that you get it nicely spaced is easy to do with the smaller numbers. But uh, here's a modular 32 times 32. So look, it looks exactly like that almost, except for sort of doubled, right? Yeah, which is, I mean, 16 times two is 32, so like that didn't surprise me. And then when I uh, do the modular 16 times eight, I get sort of both sides, right? And that's what happens with uh, modular 32 times 16, kind of neat. Uh, this is with some stylistic choices there, right? And uh, modular 68 times 17, and some stylistic choices. Very nice. See, you didn't know I was an artist, right? 
Yeah. Art prize awaits. Modular 92 times 24. All right, do you all see a circle? I drew a bunch of straight lines, and when I got done drawing a straight line, I have circles. I have this one in the middle, right? But that's, that's not so exciting, but this one, look at that, that's, that's kind of neat. Straight lines make curves. Modular 100 times 21. Now I've got uh, this outside one doesn't count. I put that one there, but I've got this inside circle, and then I've got this extreme inside circle. Very cool. Modular 100 times uh, 10. So I want to point out that when I make my modular big, so in this case 100, I have more nodes around the outside, 100 in fact, right? So I have more canvas, so to speak, to, to draw and connect things to. I think you could look at it that way. So the shapes get more interesting. So uh, it starts to, yeah, it really gives you that, that impression of 3D, 3D almost, right? It really does. So let's look at this times 10. This one's a little hard to see on the screen, so I pointed out. This is this times 10. And it's hard to see, but do you see these sort of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 sort of indent petals that are happening there? This is uh, modular 100 times 9, and I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of those petals. If I do times uh, eight and I get seven of those petals, I'll think there's a pattern, right? Because in math, anytime three things show up at once, it must be a pattern. That's a joke. That's not always the case, right? Well, let's see. Uh, I, skipped, I skipped to six, but it's easier to see with six. Let's see, I have one, two, three, four, five of those petals, right? So one, two, three, four, five. So six minus one is five. And then there's four here, right? So one, two, three, four, with a times four, or times five. And there's three of them there. And two of them there. And uh, one of them there. And this is the one that, uh, we're here for, that's called the cardioid. So I took a circle, I did modular 100 with times two, I connected all the lines, and I get this uh, the shape, which in mathematics we know is a cardioid. Very cool, I think, right? So this cardioid, a little cleaner picture of it, is uh, something that's been known about for a long time in mathematics. So it's, it's been constructed very early. Um, so let's talk about a couple of the things that we know about this thing. The reason it's called a cardioid is because it looks like a Valentine's heart, right? That's, that's the right, why we call it a cardioid. So one construction of this cardioid is uh, I took a circle, and the circle touches where the cardioid starts, and it touches on the outside. And then if I rotate a line around and make that intersection, I get, uh, I get a cardioid. So at each of those places, I trace that out. And effectively, what we're doing with modular arithmetic is that construction, right? So as, think of the lines we're drawing as connecting our, those blue lines. Right? And we just have a bunch of them, and that's the construction we're doing in order to get that cardioid shape that we're getting there. 
That is a classic construction of the cardioid. Another very famous construction of the cardioid is a continuous construction. So I have two circles of equal radius, and they are just touching each other. And I put my, uh, I put my pen at a certain spot on the circle on top, and then I rotate that circle around. And when I do that, I get a cardioid. Now that cardioid's flipped over because the it's spinning that way. But if I spun it the other way, it would be the same direction as we've had it. When you take Calc 2, you'll, uh, you'll study the polar equation for a cardioid. And this is, uh, so R is a function of theta. And that uh, function of theta is equal to 1 plus sine of theta. And uh, when I trace that out, as theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, I get a, I get a cardioid. And uh, let's see here if I can talk fast enough to stay up with the animation. So at 0, I start here. And when theta is equal to uh, pi over 2 or 90 degrees, I get right at the top there. And when, uh, so 90 degrees straight up, I get right at the top. And when uh, theta is equal to pi, or 180 degrees, I get half, the top half of my cardioid. And the same for if I go all the way around to 3 pi over 2, I get right here. So that's the same as negative 90 degrees, right? So I'm straight down. And then all the way around is 2 pi, or 360 degrees. Well, whenever we encounter a new shape, we try to find out what the area of that new shape is. So uh, let's see if we can figure out what the area of this cardioid is. Well, I'm going to start with a circle and see if I can figure out how to do this. So I have the equation of the circle in a polar equation. It's just radius of theta equals 1. So the radius of the circle is equal to 1. And uh, we know that the area of a circle is pi r squared. So in this case, that's just pi. And uh, whenever you're stuck in math, the first thing you should do is look it up on Google. No, I'm kidding. You don't do that. Whenever you're stuck in math, you integrate, right? That's in your Calc 2 especially, if you don't know what to do, to start integrating things and see what happens. And so uh, I took the radius squared and integrated it from 0 to 2 pi all the way around. And I evaluate it, and I get 2 pi. The problem is, is that's not right. The area of that circle is not 2 pi. The area of that circle is just pi. But I can fix that. How do I fix it? Divide everything by 2. If I divide everything by 2, then uh, divide by 2, divide by 2, divide by 2. And I just get pi. So. I'm going to say that this is the formula to find the area of that circle. So then I'm going to apply that idea to my cardioid. So I have a half from 0 to 2 pi, r squared d theta, where this is r. And so I get that. Very exciting. Not a hard integral at all to do. If I multiplied this out, expanded it, 1 plus 2 sine of theta plus sine squared of theta, d theta. And using the properties of integrals, multiplied it through. And then the antiderivative. So this antiderivative is just theta. This antiderivative is minus 2 sine of theta, or minus to cosine of theta when I take the antiderivative of sine. And then this one is a little bit harder, but it's not so bad. If I just remember that uh, sine squared of theta is the same thing as 1 half times 1 minus 
cosine of 2 theta, then uh, those are the same thing. I just take the antiderivative of this, which is theta minus theta minus sine 2 theta divided by 2 is the antiderivative. And I plug in those values, and when I plug in all those values, I get uh, 3 pi over 2. So 1 and a half times pi is the area of a cardioid. So what I think is fascinating is we started with a circle, and we drew a bunch of lines on the circle. That is very, very, very discrete, discrete mathematics, right? Really discrete mathematics. From that, we got a cardioid, which I described as a continuous form of mathematics, and r theta equals 1 plus sine of theta. And we use continuous mathematics to find its area. So I am constantly passionate about finding connections of the beauty of mathematics. And I think that it's amazing that I take a very discrete thing, multiplication and connecting lines, and I use that to sort of connect between a continuous thing of calculus, which is a very continuous thing. I think that's very cool and very awesome. So play around with uh, different shapes and different modulars, and you get all kinds of cool shapes. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? Anyone have any questions? Is that the order you tighten your lug nuts? Yeah, the modular really tighten the lug nuts. That would be good, yeah, for sure. Yeah, John. Yep. Yep. Have you done anything with the modular to create one of those? Yes. So I constructed all of these using Desmos. And uh, so let me pull that up here. And by the way, let me show you a couple of things. This is the construction that I used for to make all my slides. Um, hang on just a second, I gotta close out of PowerPoint. So I used uh, Desmos to create all these things. And uh, so, for example, this is the, the slope of the line with the position of all of the, um, of the points. And I used the M for modular and T for the time so that I could experiment with different, different phases. The problem is, is that this is connecting to the internet, and then their server is doing all of that computation and putting it back on my server, and it's actually quite slow. So what I did, it's a little less precise, is I wrote another form leaving out any time where the slope was equal to zero, because computationally that's slowing things down. So let me show that particular one. So for the purpose of and I call it mod art for speed. So it's much faster, but it also is missing parts. So anytime the slope of that tangent line connecting is zero, it's not there. Um, so computationally, it's much faster because it's not, it's not making this part zero, and so it's much faster. So to John's question, if I make the mod very high, and then let the multiplications run, you see all these different shapes. And uh, if I get the right order, you see different 
patterns emerging. So let me make this one the highest one. And even this is a little bit slow connecting over the internet. Mm. Now it's using Wi-Fi, so it's even slower. Let me do a little smaller. There we go. So you see these different patterns and shapes. And as you get the right combination, you'll see where you have that loop that you have with the, I never say it right, but with the um, different polar equations. And effectively, when I have r of theta equals 1 plus sine of a theta, as I change that a from with a 1, I get no loop. And then with a 2, I get the 1 loop. And then each number a, I make it integer bigger, I get petals. So this is an approximation of those shapes without having where the tangent lines are equal to zero. So experimenting with different varieties, I get different different shapes. What all of those are, I don't know. I you just have enough for the Yeah. And it's it's really it's kind of neat. The uh, sometimes what happens is <laughs> I see when I try to stop it, but it's delayed a little bit, right? And so then I have to you know, oh man, I missed it, and I go back and try to find it. So um, and I printed off some ones and put them you know, up on my office door, and then I forgot to write down which combination some of those were, and I was like, oh, rats, right? But it might be neat to really sit down and think about what's happening with uh, odd modulars and even times, or odd modular and odd times, and, or multiples, right? So, or what's happening if I have prime and prime, or prime and even, or all those different combinations. What, if there's a general, general way to do. That may have already been done in the mathematical community. I suppose it probably has been. I just haven't run across any literature that's, like people have formalized that. Any other questions? No? All right, well thank you very much again.